<laughs> All right. Welcome to our weekly guides talk with the Amneska Mountain Adventures. Uh, this week, very much a talk. I have got the uh, privilege of uh, interviewing and talking with my uh, colleague, uh, Charing Dorji Sherpa. And uh, namaste, Charing. And namaste. Namaste to everyone out there watching. And uh, Charing and I are predicting that namaste is going to become a much more form, uh, common form of greeting in the future than the handshake. So yeah, yeah, we'll get into it here. And uh, yeah, I'll just uh, start with uh, some questions that I've got here. So Charing, when and where were you born? Well, uh, thanks for joining, first of all. Uh, namaste, hi, uh, Tashi <laughs> Um, I was born in 1989 uh, in a remote valley, uh, remote mountain valley called Roali, which is uh, at the elevation of around 4,000 meters from the sea level. Uh, <clears throat> it's a uh, borderline to Tibet. So it's like Northeast of Kathmandu uh, and it's borderline to Tibet. From there you can access to uh, Everest region. You have to go to the pass, the most popular pass called Tashi Lapsa Pass. Uh, it's also a very hidden valley. We call the bill, it's called the Sigler Hidden Valley. Mm -hmm. So yeah. for some of the people who've been to Nepal, if this was um, the uh, Kathmandu and this was Mount Everest, uh, where would the Rawaling be? It's right in the middle. In the middle. All right, yeah. We got a picture of the uh, Rawaling Valley flashing through there. Beautiful, beautiful looking place. And uh, how large was your family? Uh, we were uh, six siblings, uh, including uh, four daughters and uh, two sons. All right. And uh, my, my, my parents. But uh, unfortunately, my father passed away when I was two years old, when my younger sister was just born. All right. And did your, how did your father pass away, if you don't mind my asking? So... I think it's mostly about the food, food poison. I'm not sure about regarding how, you know, what was the cause. But when I, I asked my mom, she never told me, but I think it was uh, from the food poison because we we're in a remote area and we don't have any hospital or nothing. So, yeah. Right. Well, I'm very sorry to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. How big was your town? What was the population of the town that you were born in? So the, I don't know the land area about my, the, our, like the whole valley. So the whole rolling valley is a combination of, you know, tiny little villages. So we have a summer village is like around 40 to 100 meters. And then we have a middle village and then uh, it's, which is uh, like maybe 3,800 meters. And then we have a winter house uh, totally around 3,500 meters. So mm -hmm. in the season, so we go up and down. In the summer, we go in the mountains and in the winter season, we go to the lower lands. Yeah. And then according to 2015, we had like 72 households and uh, less than 400 people. Oh, wow. majority of the, yeah. So majority of people, they live in uh, Kathmandu these days. Right. So right. overall in one year, maybe around 50 people, they live up there the whole life and are mostly senior peoples and mostly widows. Oh, wow. And uh, widows, uh, why are there so many widows up there? Because all the, you know, most of the husband that died in the mountains, or climbing mountains, so, yeah. Right, right. Huh, that's uh, uh, tragic yeah. and... Uh, well, well, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, my mom, uh, my mom basically, you know, uh, you know, brought us back, like, you know, she was the one who raised us and she didn't have any job or nothing. So it's just like, she was a housewife, so, yeah. Right. And uh, I'm very... Uh, you know, thanks to my older sister, maybe when she was like 14, 15 years old, she, you know, uh, she helped a lot to make some money for the family. So she, she did some foreign job, even she went to the past and, you know, uh, kind of stopped and make money for the family. Right. And uh, what was your childhood like? 
Well, it's not interesting like the tile in North America. So I grew it in a different wall. It's pretty dark. Yeah. Um, you know, <clears throat> I was raised in a place where they, we have no electricity, you know, uh, where we don't need a fancy clothes or fancy food to eat. Um, we just had a very simple life. Like we grew up in a place where we eat potatoes maybe three times a day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so right when I was about to stand on my feet, I need to, um, we were taught to how to carry the hoe for plowing the potato, right? Yeah. Or plowing the lands. And uh, we have a bamboo sack. Mm -hmm. I would carry on those in the my head. Yeah. And uh, we just, they just taught us how to use the axe so we can cut the grasses or cut the hood. Uh, yeah, so basically we, we live a very simple life. Uh, we live in a place where we cook in a firewood and it's still these days, we still do it. My mom still do it the same way, yeah. All right, and were you responsible for any animals? Did you have yaks or? Unfortunately, my family didn't have yaks, but we had lots of goat and sheep during that when I was, when I was a kid. Uh, these days, my mom had lots of cows. But back right. in those days, we didn't have, we didn't have yeah, we didn't have uh, yaks or, or knack. Uh, we only have sheep. So, so I'm like, I'm used to, you know, looking up sheep and yaks. I even know how to skin them and milk them. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, so like my job, when I was maybe five, six years old, my job was to, you know, look out of those animals. I need to go to the forest to get a firewood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, collect the firewood. And then in the summer, we have to uh, cut the grass and then store that for the winter. And also, yeah, like you just have to carry the bamboo sack to the head stop and, and then carry the ax or knife or whatever. You have to go to the forest, especially in summer. Uh, um, I go in the forest and collect the, uh, you know, the fiddlehead. Yeah. Fiddlehead. Huh? Yeah. So that's our job. Like we need to collect the fiddlehead and store for the winter. And also like collecting like the wild mushrooms or like a lot of wild vegetables. That's mm -hmm. what we eat. In. We store them in the summer and then eat that in the winter kind of thing. Right, yeah. right. And did you have the opportunity to go to school? Uh, it's very interesting. Like we had a school, I think it was maybe donated by Hillary or maybe built by Hillary, sorry, Edmund Hillary. But uh, during my time we had the roof, but we didn't have any teacher. There is a bunch of like chairs and tables. But we didn't have any, you know, we didn't have teachers. Maybe the teacher will come like once a year and mm -hmm. then it's, it's there for like two days and then gone. So until I was nine years old, uh, you know, whatever I learned was must, just the alphabet. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. And then after 10 years old, did you, uh, how, how did your schooling work out? Uh, so when I was nine years old, I, was brought to Kathmandu by my older brother, who was, um, by the time maybe he was uh, maybe 17 years old. And he was actually a monk. Uh, he was studying in India. Uh, my uncle took um, when he was very young. Mm -hmm. So he was a monk and he became a Sherpa, climbing Sherpa. And, that, and that's how uh, he was supporting the family. And he was playing the role of the father, right? So. And in Nepal, as a, being a son in a family, you have the lots of wisdom that you have to look for all the families. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so he he gave me the opportunity, he brought me to Kathmandu. Uh, during that time, uh, it took at least six days hike, and then uh, and then you get to the uh, access to the road, and then you jump in the bus. So when I was nine, that was the first time I saw the, all these uh, buses and all this kind of stuff. All right, and. Um... How long did you uh, attend school in Kathmandu for? So I remember it was maybe 97 and then I was in grade 10 in 2005. Uh-huh, all right. And um, yeah, um, your brother was involved as a, uh, a climbing Sherpa, is that right? Yeah, so I think maybe he was 17 and he withdrew from Monk, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and, uh, and then, uh, um, he became a Sherpa. I think he submitted everything four or five times. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. How, oh, how yeah. many, how many times has your family summited Everest? <laughs> well, me and my, my, me and my brother. So, uh, that's it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Great. And, uh, yeah. How did, how did you become in, involved in mountaineering? 
So um, after the you know lost my brother in 2005 in Avalanche in Kangaroo in Western part of Nepal. So the entire expedition crew died, including my brother. And as I mentioned earlier, I was in grade 10. It was like almost the end of my school. And um, now um, we lost uh, the, you know, the main source of income. He, who, who, my brother was doing that. And then uh, it was came to my resume now because I'm only son in the family. Uh, so when I was living in Kathmandu. I was a student. I didn't have any money. And then uh, it started with my sister-in-law just went pregnant when my brother died. So we had nobody, you know, to make the money for the family. And uh, then um, I thought maybe I'm, you know, I'm now, I can maybe be more independent. So I was looking around to find a job. And uh, I finished my school, the that year I finished my school. And then I was uh, uh, young enough to make a citizenship and passport. So uh, I made a passport and citizenship and then uh, looking around for a Sherpa job. And at that time, I was just, I know I haven't, I don't have any experience in mountaineering, right? I have I haven't ever climbed Everest. Getting a Sherpa job was very tough. If you are a summiter, then you will be, you have a priority, you will get a Sherpa job. But me as a non-summiter and young, uh, nobody get me the Sherpa job. So I asked a bunch of Sherpas or a bunch of soldats that were from my village for a job, give me a Sherpa job. And uh, they said, okay, you know, like, okay, I will think about it. And then, uh, uh, after that, I never heard from them. So luckily, my brother-in-law, Hassan, who now owns a guiding company called uh, Hungry Tricks, uh, he said, you know, maybe you want to go in Kitchen Boy? Yeah, if you want to go to Kitchen Boy, you know, I can, uh, I can uh, send with uh, our company or something like that. And <clears throat> so I was able to get a Kitchen Boy job uh, with uh, my brother-in-law's father guiding company. That time there was with a, with a Japanese guiding company the rolling trick. And uh, I was able to go to Kitchen Boy job, do the Kitchen Boy work in uh, Sizapangma with a uh, uh, Japanese client. And he is quite a big name. His name is Mura. So mm -hmm. it was six in the spring. And I got the opportunity to go to Kitchen Boy job with Mura in Sizapangma. All right. Uh, yeah. How old were you at that time, cheering? I was, seven, I was, I was 17. Right, right. Seven. Uh, Oh, good. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. yeah. So Our that trip, ability. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, you know, that time I was 17 and then the kitchen by job is pretty tough job, right? So yeah. doing all of this, you know, making food for the, the Sherpas and uh, making, you know, help the cook uh, to prepare the meal for the uh, member as well. And so you know, I was like treated like a servant for my by my soldier. You know, like five in the morning, I have to make them a milk coffee or milk tea, and then I have to get them to the tent. And uh, you know, five in the evening, I have to warm up the alcohol and take them to the tent. So I had a very bad sore throat. I lost my voice. Uh -huh. um, so like, if I'm late by like few minutes, then they're gonna be like, you know, doing something big, F sign, yelling from the. <laughs> You know, yeah, I can like I can't speak like Sarah. He's like <sighs> that's kind of stuff. Yeah, and then my first experience going to the glacier was, was like the same in the same expedition. So the Sardar sent me to base camp. So it was like end of the expedition. So the Sardar sent me to base camp to put the yaks and all the transportations because we are going home. And then I come back uh, from like the there's bunch of base camp, like Chinese base camp or like Elmas base camp. So I went myself, and then the next day when I came back from the Chinese base camp, they sent he sent me to Camp One of Sisapangma. He told me to go there and get the tent down. Like you know, I have never put a crampons in my life, never been to the glacier, never been to the rocks, and you know, I never put the harness. And then yeah, so I went with other Sherpa, one Sherpa, he was from my village as well, and I went with him, and and then yeah, just you know. Dragging, no, I didn't have any gym or nothing. I think the harness that I have was the retired harness, maybe just the waist belt, like kind of thing. He took me in the glacier, just like, you know, grabbing on a fixed line. And I went up to camp one. And um, yeah, so um, oh, I made oh. all the in camp back down the road. And yeah, huh. I, and that's how it started. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, I, I know that uh, the cook boys 
work is a lot. One time I, I carried my cook boys, kitchen boys load up to Lukla and uh, put it on the top line. And uh, I thought I would carry the load up to Lukla for him, but I think I only made it halfway. I wasn't strong enough to carry it all the way up to Lukla. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, luckily I was an experienced. I was an experienced kitchen boy, so I didn't need to yeah. carry that. I know the taking kitchen and stuff. Yes, they have to carry all those loads. You know, like the yeah. prepare food, pack, clean. Yeah, that's a lot of work. Yeah. And and, <laughs> and uh, what was the what was the money like? Did you how much did you do you felt you know how much did you get think, paid? Yeah, that time as a kitchen boy, I think I was paid maybe fifteen hundred dollar. Right. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. Good. And well, I got the tips as well. Yeah, so <laughs> and that's that. Yeah, that's okay. Look. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good. Yeah. Well, it's uh. And then, yeah, with that money, I went to uh, the college because in Nepal they have a different uh, standard of going to school. So after grade ten, you go to Fluids College. So with that money, I went uh, to college for one year, and okay. also was in Kathmandu, and also like you know supporting my, myself and my family as well. Oh, yeah. great. Great. Well, it's a, yeah. it's amazingly hard life by, you know, standards of what most people in Canada grow up in. So yeah, <laughs> a lot of responsibility to have on your forehead with a tump line at 17 years old. <laughs> well, yeah, like me, like I was used to when I was like six, seven years old. That's what I used to do. Like, you know, we have, we don't, have, we don't know how to carry back, right? We didn't have a backpack, so we just have to get, you know, like the bamboo sound just yeah. getting their head stop song yeah. yeah well it's interesting that <laughs> all cultures that carry very heavy loads like 90 kilograms they all carry it on the head westerners are the only ones who put it on the shoulder so it's it's interesting yeah yeah, yeah. i guess mine may be strong as well too <laughs> yeah 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 you build up to it so um what was your first trip as a climbing sherpa um so that was 2008, but I, again in 2007, I went back uh, as a kitchen boy. Mm -hmm. uh, same, I didn't have luck to get a Sherpa that year. And I was with my brother-in-law, my so again, same Pasang, that he himself was guiding that expeditions. And I went uh, uh, from North side, but I was not as Sherpa as a kitchen boy. Right. And I went up to, I believe maybe it was around 7,500 meters. So I just passed the oh. North Pole. Yeah, yeah. I did as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my first Sherpa job was in 2008 when my second brother in law, so he did me a guarantee, like, okay, this he'll be strong enough to go to Sherpa job kind of thing. So he signed me and he mm -hmm. took with me. Uh, so yeah. And that time was like big drama going on between you know, Nepal and Tibet or like some Chinese, you know, they closed that you're not allowed to go in Tibet. Mm -hmm. Actually, our go to Tibet, but they shut down and even they were not sure we were going to issue the permit in Nepal kind of thing. I think there was like a big Olympic thing going on in China that days and right. yeah. Yeah, so that was, yeah, so, <clears throat> so my brother-in-law, Nimak, he's not Nimak Gelsen, so now he owns a guiding company as well, it's called Dolma Adventure. And so he took with he, uh, he took me with him and, you know, that was where my real job begins. It's very tough, like I know people have seen uh, lots of pictures, videos, whatever, but um, reality to Sherpa job is pretty tough. Like the hardest thing I found was setting up the base camp. You know, you can see only those, all those luxury stains, you know, all those things. It's hard, it's all glacier. You have to chop them, make a nice flat form, right? And these days you will see like big luxury dome tents kind of thing. It's all hard, um, you know, I don't know how many times I lost my, uh, got a blister on my fingers and you know how many times I, you know, got a new skins. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, and then again, in the same, like I didn't have any official trainings, right? So I just um, follow what my brother-in-law says and what other shepherds uh, say. So just, I just follow behind them. And uh, the tough, tough days was like, uh, I have never been to like to camp four, it's around 8,000 meters. So, and we, we, we didn't have, uh, you know, many days, many weather windows, or it was getting late because of the pushback by the, you know, the closing of all the mountains. Um, so we did 
like we have to like carry the loads one time in camp four so that we don't want a single push. So uh, there were two other Sherpas as well. And uh, they said they carried like six oxygen bottles. And me, I have never carried oxygen, that was much weight up there. And I said, well, if you guys are carrying six, and I will carry six. So I went, uh, I carried that load, dropped them at the same time with these guys in mm. camp four is a thousand meters. And then the next couple of days, we have to go to Summit Fush, right? So I come back to camp two, I got a fever that night. And I didn't tell to, um, you know, I didn't tell to my other shepherd friends because if I told them, then I'm going to lose my summit chance. So uh, for me, the summiting was the most, you know, like the important part <laughs> because right, right. if I got that year, next year, I don't need to worry about, uh, you know, looking for another, you know, everybody can welcome me. <laughs> That's kind of stuff. So yeah. So I, I, you know, I just took a rest on that day in camp two and I got, well, I got, um, I didn't have a fever, so my fever went away. I have I took medicine. It's called Nico tablet. It's I think basically paracetamol, I guess. And uh, and then uh, yeah, I just went to camp four, and then just follow with the with the clients. I have a one. I was designated shepherd for one client, so I just uh, follow behind behind him carrying his oxygen to the summit. So I don't know what's going on. You know, I don't know how to change the oxygen. I don't know how to, those oxygen work. I don't know if he fall in the rock. I don't know what's thing. So I only think that the only thing I knew was if I fall in the crevasse, I might die. That's only I think I know. But other than that, I have no idea. Not nothing. So you know. <laughs> and, and you, you you've made it to the summit of Everest. Were you were you using oxygen yourself? Yeah. So yeah, basically we used them um, because uh, we didn't have, I don't know, the company didn't give us oxygen from camp three, but we basically, I would say the basically the Sherpas used from uh, camp four. So mm -hmm. yeah, I was his option. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> great work, great work. And um, I, I, you, you, you made better money. Is that true? Well, that year um, I was paid, I think, uh, $5,500, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, so, and also, like, the, my gear that time was, uh, I think most of the gear that I use are almost retired. These days I call all those retired gear because for me, uh, as a Sherpa or a first time Sherpa, is my most priority was to save the money. So the yeah. shoes that I bought was like maybe uh, 15,000 rupees in that day, is maybe $150. Yeah, yeah. And the downshift was given by my brother-in-law, my older brother-in-law. So yeah. So and the harnesses, I don't remember. Maybe there was like retire harnesses. Yeah. So yeah. Right. <laughs> and depending on the company, the company that I worked for that year was uh, dependent. So he get, he paid me a lump sum of fifteen hundred in total, so like including everything. All right. Okay. And then. Um... Yes, you continued going on expeditions as a climbing Sherpa and uh, a number of expeditions to Everest, um, but also some other uh, Himalayan peaks. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, the most funny thing is like, after I summited Everest, right? Uh -huh. uh, I come back to Kathmandu live. And, um, and then that summer, I got a chance to uh, do the basic mountain course. So yeah. I <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. And did, then, yeah. Did you learn? Did you learn knots other than the yak knot? <laughs> no, I, I didn't know when I climbed Everest. I even didn't have to tie the yak knot. So yeah. <laughs> I learned after after I climbed Everest. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh, great, yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. And then in two thousand and nine. Yes. Yes. Until two thousand fifteen. Uh, yeah. I, Continue climbing. Yeah, every spring I was in Everest expeditions. All right, right. So, um, how many times did you end up climbing Everest? Uh, so, including a kids and boy, I went ten expeditions, I guess. And then, as a Sherpa or guide, I've been like nine expeditions, mm -hmm. and about seven times. And I was just twenty-three when I did my number twenty, number seven. Wow! Wow! And. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll just ask for people who uh, consider it important. Did you use oxygen every time you went to the top of Everest? Yeah, yeah. So 
I'm just gonna go my timeline. So in 2009, I was with RMI Expeditions. Uh, so I was very lucky and honored to be working with uh, big legendary climbers like Dave Hahn and Ed Deisters uh, in 2009. Uh, I was working with Sherpa as well. So most of the highlight of that expedition was I, I ran from camp two to camp four and then run down to base camp on the same day. Oh, so wow. I woke up camp two carrying four, five, five bottles of oxygen. So I dropped to camp four, uh, carrying a little microchip like memory card and ran down to base camp because I think they were kind of doing uh, some film productions and they had to do like daily updates kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it was a big group. And, uh, and then in 2010, I was with, uh, again, with RMI. And Devan was my leader. He has like 15 summits uh, in known Sherpas. Um, and then my client that year was, he was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we saw it as well. And that, in the fall of 2010, it was in October, we, I climbed again. Uh, so I climbed in two different seasons. I climbed in fall season. So I climbed October 15, in 2010, one guest. And uh, that was myself was guiding. I was the Sarda. <laughs> oh wow! And, uh, I'll tell that story a little bit later. So we have we were only like seven people with the best camp in October in 2010. Oh right! Oh wow! And then 2011, uh, I went back again to climb Everest with RMI. Uh, we submitted. Um, 2012, I was with the RMI, and I was uh, in 2010 and 12. We had a. Um, um, the youngest son of Jim Whittaker, who is the first American ever summiter. His son, younger son was with, with us, and we summited twice together in 2010 and 12. Oh, and wow. then 2013, I was again with RMI, and I summited for my number seven. I was there in 2014 as well uh, with RMI, and 2015 again. Oh, so right. I was in 2014 when 16 Serbs died in one spot. I was there as well. Oh, and, right. uh, when we had a, the earthquake, I was there as well. Actually, I was in Camp 1 during the earthquake. And 2014, when uh, 16 shepherds died up there, I was there. I, I was flown to Ice Bowl, which is called Football Field, and uh, I was uh, doing the recovery as well. Right. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So what was it like being at Camp 1 when the earthquake happened? Well, it was kind of white out, little white out day, and uh, that day we 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 had we were three guides, so me and Dave Han, and we had another guy called JJ Josman, and then we had five clients. We hike ourselves to camp. We touched to camp too, and we come back. It was midday, and I was having a ramen noodle. So I never forget that I'm having ramen noodles. <clears throat> right? Yeah, yeah. You know, lunch ramen noodles, and my top man, my tenth partner was. Uh, uh, Indian American, um, so I can he can speak a little Hindi, so I can I can speak broken Hindi as well. Mm -hmm. So that was in my, and I was having ramen, and then I can suddenly hear you know like the the sound everywhere, right? You can see hear the sound of the avalanche from different directions, and also you can see your you know like your 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 cam is shaking, you're you're on the top of the glacier, right? Mm -hmm. You can hear the sound of the ice cracking below you, and like you know. Wow. You know, so maybe it might be my last day, you know, I might, it might be last day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, anything, I just like, you know, you know, Dave told me, oh, it might be earthquake, you know, everybody stay in the tents and yeah, so we all stay in the tent and then suddenly we got like a boom, you know, we got a, like a powder clouds. Very lucky we didn't get a big chunk of Sorox. Uh, yeah. We got avalanche as well, we got from like Lola and even from the Nukje. Um, so, very lucky, you know, uh, and then after a few minutes later, I get out from my tent and I was looking around uh, and I see, you know, some people like out from our camp as well. Uh, and then uh, we talked to best camp, radio to best camp, uh, uh, my cook was there and all my shepherds were down there as well. Uh, we talked uh, and they said, my cook said the best camp is gone. I'm wow. like, you know, a child, like lots of things going around and and then we have satellite phones and we try to, I tried to contact my family, even in Kathmandu and back in my village. Uh, we, we didn't have any, like no communication at all because I think they lost all the receptions. Right. And, uh, and then I you know Dave called uh, 
they call the army base in Washington and then they did update on the website and my wife found out uh, that I was alive in Camp One. But yeah, that was a you know big relief for my wife. Right. Yeah. And until four days, I didn't have any communications. And we waited for a couple more days in Camp Camp One. And we were sorting out all the root, root assessment and you know, like we we're trying to figure out how we kind of get down. Um, yeah, and then um, most of the most of the team uh, were like, you know, in a panic mode. Yeah. I think everybody was kind of panicky, right? So we mm -hmm. tried to so calm and um, <clears throat> we tried to figure out how we can get down. Um, so there were a few people. They came from few. I think the Western guides. They come from. Uh, we team up like with a few people going from Camp One and people coming from Base Camp and then doing the root assessment. And uh, I sent my two Sherpas. None of the group they sent the Sherpas up. I, you know, I convinced my Sherpas and two Sherpas come up halfway and and then again we got hit by another uh, aftershock. But luckily they were all out from the iceberg. Yeah. And then our only option, our only option was to fly out. So that's going to be like the most. Expensive three minute ride. <laughs> yeah. So we took the expensive three minute rides. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 yeah good choice. Um, yeah. Just to backtrack though, when did you get married? Um, so in 2013, I met my wife. Actually, I was uh, planned to go to uh, uh, Pakistan with a uh, mountain professional. We were planning to go to uh, Broad Peak and uh, uh, yeah, I think Z1 and Z2 are probably kind of thing. And uh, there was some visa issues. So I canceled my expedition. So I was free and uh, I met my wife and we started dating until 2015. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so in 2015, so it, during earthquake, uh, my wife wow. was pregnant. Big well, changes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, we didn't do any fancy marriages, right? So, yeah. um, but uh, we did, we have a unique culture in my place. Yeah. A very unique culture. So, um, you know, if your um, uh, girl's family accept like a 25 cents and a few drinks, then you are officially married. You don't need to like, you know, uh, do fancy marriage, it's up to you. If they don't accept them, they have different steps. <laughs> so right, I did very right. simple. So I can, it's up to me or up to us if we, if we want to do a big fancy marriage or not. So yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. wow. Fabulous. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> Congratulations again and again. But uh, back to Thank the you. earthquake, how, how was your family and your valley in the Rawalling? How did, did the earthquake affect uh, the Rawalling? Uh, it was pretty bad. Like, I lost all my family homes, you know, um, all my house. Like, our house it doesn't have good foundation, right? So it's basically stacking of rocks. Mm -hmm. So we lost uh, all my family house. Uh, the, the house in Na, we called Na and Pering, those are two different separate villages. Uh, we're all cracked, didn't completely fall down, but it's all cracked. So they were living in a tent for a while. And then my winter village is totally under a big pile of rock debris. So we lost everything down there. But luckily it was kind of in the spring. So all my family, they were in, in, in the upper village, we call summer village in Na. So they were up there. No, good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you you can rebuild uh, uh, wood and rock, but you can't rebuild people's lives. Yeah, yeah. So I'm very happy yeah, so that your family did well. Nobody, you know, there were a few senior people got injured, but uh, nobody was alive. Yeah, but in Everest, Everest was pretty bad. Like I think over 20 plus people died, and many injured, and we were very lucky. Like. Uh, Majority of people who died in Everest Base Camp was all the, the Nepali staff, because most of the clients and the guides they were all either in Camp One and Camp Two. So during our, like a acclimatizing process, so we all up there, very lucky. If it was like a respite, you know, resting time, then there'll be like I don't know how many casualties yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Lucky, yeah. Yeah. yeah so. For your Everest years, um, is there any uh, memory that's the, the best memory for you, your, your fondest memory of uh, your time on Mount Everest? Um, I think the most, uh, you know, I think the most memorable for me on Everest is in, I climbed in the, in the autumn season. 
when there was nobody up in the mountains. Yeah, yeah. All those crazy pictures, right? Uh, yeah, it was in 2010 in the fall season, and uh, I was uh, given the, the sorda, the exhibition sorda, or climbing sorda. So I was just 21 years old, and uh, this company, uh, Himalayan Trail Blazer, um, and I was I like Tanga Tsringima. Uh, so he, he gave me the opportunity to be a sardar. So I was just 21. I have some, you know, little experience. Uh, so we were five Sherpas. We were all very strong, young. I was the youngest. Most other Sherpas were like 24, 25. The oldest one is 30. And uh, at the beginning, there were um, three groups. Mm -hmm. There were like Japanese groups and then and his plan, Japanese group, his plan was to do solo. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was five, I think it's from Slovenia or Czech, Czech Republic. Uh, but at the end, uh, we worked all together up to camp three. Uh, we set up the fixed line all by ourselves up to camp three. And after that, they all, they quit. They went back. And we, we keep continuing up because um, my clients, he was in a mission. So he was doing like the uh, uh, Everest, North Pole and South Pole in the year. So it's kind of like a, like, so we, <clears throat> we started fixing the rope. So I, I remember from camp three to the summit, uh, we fixed, I guess over 4,000 meter ropes and we all carried by four of us or five of us. Um, and we didn't have, you know, very short with the window. And yeah. uh, on October 15, we made to the summit. So, no yeah, so like, on the sunny day, uh, I think I remember I carried like four bottles of oxygen and uh, three, 300 meter ropes. And then I started six in the evening fixing the ropes because I was a bit more, a little technical knowledge in the team. Yeah. And I was a soldier. So I started six in the evening. I took one of the Sherpas with me and uh, we started fixing the whole night. And uh, we passed the triangular phase. And then I remember there is a big rock in balcony so we can take a rest. But I didn't see that rock in that time. And later I saw that rock was way behind because it was dark in nighttime. I just, you know, hit yeah. the, hit the, yeah. So <laughs> huh. it was quite challenging. And then, yeah, we, we fixed it. We fixed and we got to the Hillary steps and people are like making these days all about the Hillary step is gone. That time we didn't see that rock. Like yeah. we didn't notice that rock because there was lots of snow and yeah. I almost got close right up there as well, fixing the ropes. And, yeah, around uh, 12.20, I got to the summit. Mm -hmm. And uh, after 10 minutes, like, we all got to the summit. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, did you find in your time on Everest also, were there any of your clients who were as strong as the Sherpas at altitude? And be yeah. honest. <laughs> well, uh, to be honest, yes. Because I work with lots of guides, the Western guides. They're pretty mm -hmm. strong, yeah. Even they carry the auction in summit as well. So yeah, but the only thing we, as a Sherpa work for the company, what they do is even your Western guides, um, they will give you a personal Sherpa, so they're gonna have little help. But yeah, very strong. And most of the summit that I climbed uh, are I didn't stay in Everest Camp Three. So most of the even with the clients, we mm -hmm. basically walk from Camp Two. So we right, did, right. Def, all my summit are from uh, Camp Two. So yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, and, you know, we all have the same block, so <laughs> yeah, if we get yeah. cut, we get rid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And just a matter of exercise. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'll, I'll ask a, another way. Do you think any of the Western guides or clients could carry as much on a summit day as a Sherpa can? Well, that's a tough question. So I, <laughs> I put you on the spot. Well, then, lots of, you know, there is. <laughs> Well, there is lots of, uh, you know, people have done it, like, you know, they have solo it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. <laughs> so um, when uh, when did you uh, get in involved in getting your guiding certifications? Becoming a mountain guide? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, since 2008, so after I submitted, I took the master mastering course. And that year, I was actually supposed to graduate from high school. And it didn't work for, for me because uh, I always miss my exam. So like in, during springtime when I'm in the mountains, they always find an exam for the school. So, you know, I could not finish my school. And, and I thought maybe this is not gonna work for me. So uh, I might have to change to the mountain and, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe continue the guiding certifications. 
So I started 2008 and then uh, I applied for the aspirant guide in 2009. I didn't quite qualify. And then in 2010, I was, uh, I was selected and I finished my finance certification in 2013. And I was 23 as that as well. Uh, at the, I was 23 and I believe maybe I was the youngest, but maybe these days there are lots of younger than me as well. Yeah. Oh, and I didn't, I didn't fail any exam though. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Well, as any mountain guide who has failed an exam can tell you, they could name things that they would rather do than fail an exam. Um, yeah, like that, yeah, like in 2010 and in my selection time, there was like, we're 17 people. Mm -hmm. And then after then we were four people. Oh, right. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Small, yeah. small select elite group. So um, yeah. how did how did it uh, how did you uh, it work out that you ended coming to Canada? Well, that's a long story again, Barry. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so <laughs> it was uh, in okay. 2012. In 2012, I was very uh, lucky to meet Debbie Stark, who is the director of Anuska. Yeah. And uh, on the trip to uh, Everest Base Camp and Olympic expedition. So during that time, there were I think. Uh, there was a big Canadian groups. Um, there were like 10 soldiers, I believe, and maybe 16 civilians from Canada. Mm -hmm. And, and <clears throat> you, you have a documentary on CBC as well. They make a big documentary. Uh, it's all, all about like Winter Warrior Project. Um, and then, uh, so my conversation from to, to come to Canada started when I give a right, you know, I give a right to uh, one of the one of the civilians from that trip because he need to go to downtown of Kathmandu. He need mm -hmm. to go to Tamil. Yeah. And I need to go, you know, and we were sorting out all the equipment, you know, I have like boots and crampons kind of thing. And yeah. I need to change some of the boots and crampons as well. So uh, his name is John, John Clarkson. Uh, he's from Cochrane. Um, so I gave him a ride in my border bike, my Ninja motorbike. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Getting like a few crampons without any case, right? You know six, seven crampons, and then riding on those low helmet, riding on those, you know, busy strip of Kathmandu, you know that. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, so he, he, you know, he said, you want to come to Canada, you know, you know, for me, it's kind of dream, like right? maybe I'm dreaming, right? Because <laughs> for me, like, you know, in the beginning, I, did, I didn't trust because there were lots of people uh, that I met, uh, like in the expedition, they say, yeah, maybe I can invite to my country kind of thing. And then, we exchange our information that we never get back. Mm -hmm. So uh, during the experience you tell, and then after that, when you go back to your country, you yeah. never respond to that, right? So <laughs> now I know why. So um, yeah, so John, uh, John sent me an email back after even he, we finished the expeditions uh, and he's keep sending me an email back uh, every time he asks me, you know, how, what's, how is everything kind of thing. And then, uh, and then in 2013, after I finished my certification i sent an email to john like john i'm interested in learning ski and now i'd like to come to canada and then um, you know being a developing country it's kind of hard the visa will be the biggest issue yeah so we keep trying for the visa i was denied twice and then uh, so john sent me sponsor letter yamnuska sent me a uh, sponsor letters and then there is a bunch of other people from the same trip they send me sponsor letters and I was rejected twice, and on the third time, uh, they gave me the tourist visa, oh, and then, then I got the opportunity to come in a big plane. <laughs> yeah, right. So yeah, 20, uh, 2013 winter, or oh. January, uh, 2014, I came here as a tourist for the first time, and uh, that the year where uh, John and uh, all his family, darling, Claire Duncan, and uh, even Jim Cassie and do from Canmore. Everybody welcomed me uh, as an extended family. Now they're all my, like my family in Canada. <laughs> yeah. And then also I was very um, lucky to meet and you know I was welcomed by Dave, Jesse and Len as well, in Yamluska as well. And I still remember um, I went ice climbing with you. I don't know if you remember or not, but you took me ice climbing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so with the uh, British armies, uh, I went ice climbing with you. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I spent uh, two and a half months uh, that year in 2014, and I did my uh, avalanche um, 
operation level one with CAA and also did ASD and I did ASD with Dave as well. And all my expenses in that trip was paid by John Clarkson. All my flights, all my logistics, everything in Canada, even all my like the expenses for the CAA trainings, everything was paid by uh, John. So he is, is not like my father now. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, it's great. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so the first thing you did in Canada was ski. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I was. I think I was twenty five. I was twenty five, and also that was the first time I celebrated my birthday. <laughs> well, darling, big for me. I didn't know what that for, and yeah, that was the first time when I celebrated my birthday. And the most funny was like, you know, I'm big boy. Like I'm a big big boy right so even like two three years four five years old kids like flying in the skis and i'm just like falling up the skis all the time like i was i was, I was so shy <laughs> and so john daughter and my son uh Duncan has broken legs and he taught me how to ski and he oh, right. taught me how to ski. and right. yeah john uh, put me in the ski ski you know ski class for two days right in castle mountain in castle mountain uh and I was a ski bomb for more than a month. Oh, so great. All the people from the Castle Mountain Ski Resort know me. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <great>. Like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, are you planning to uh, do the ski side of your certification here in Canada? Are you going to do the ski guide? Time goal. So that's going to be a long time goal. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, I know it's quite expensive to get through it. Yeah. So I'll yeah. try my best. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> so it's the month of May. And for a lot of the uh, last decade, you would have been summiting Mount Everest, the highest mountain on the planet. And these years in May, you might often be at Rundle Rock outside of Banff, teaching rock climbing to British soldiers on a cliff that is maybe 50 feet high. So how has that changed for you? Well, it's a, it's a big change, like, you know, <laughs> it was a big change. <laughs> um, actually, tomorrow marks my 12th anniversary for my first summit. Uh, yeah, so um, the first thing is um, I can come home every night with my family. Yeah. I can have beer every night if yeah. I want. <laughs> yeah. And I feel secure. I'm secure and I get paid more. Yes. 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 <laughs> right. Uh, I don't need to walk in the middle of the night, and I don't need to worry about uh, you know, you know, walking in the ice falls and the middle of the night, you know, like chanting Om Mani Padme kind of thing. So, yeah, um, yeah. But I miss those days as well. Sometimes yeah. I miss those days, and yeah. you know, um, you know, once I sign up in Everest, either as a Sherpa or or as a guide, uh, like. It put lots of pressure to my family. It's lots of stress to my family. And I'm not sure whether I'll come back home alive or not. So that's kind of fear always roam around in the mind. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um, I'm definitely go back. I will yeah. definitely go back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Kids are a bit young, so I want to spend more time. And yeah, definitely I'll go back. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> oh, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. What uh what dreams do you have? Uh um, for the future in Canada for yourself? What are the goals or dreams that you see? Well, I don't know. Like, you know, I might learn ice hockey. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I tried ice hockey, you know, I keep falling down. I didn't want to, you know, bruise my butt. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that might be, yeah. But yeah, so obviously skiing more. Yeah. And yeah. All yeah. Right. I don't have yeah. just work and you know spending time with family and yeah, taking every care of my girls and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and um your girls, how old are your girls now? My older one is uh four and a half and the younger one is two and a half. All right. So, so yeah, yeah, wow. very young family. Then oh. uh, four and a half year old will go to kindergarten in about a year's time. And uh, do you do you or do you look into the future for your daughters? Um, will they be in Canada? Do you think, or will they be in Nepal or in both places? Well, 
it's up to them, right? Mm -hmm. they, I will just give them, you know, what, what they want to decide. <clears throat> but right, right now, I already introduced my the four years world, how to ski and how to climb as well. So, you know, it's like in the workshops, you know, so you know, even, so you don't, they didn't get to the point of tying the knots, but yeah, so you know, helmets and all kinds of things, right? I took him like, I took her for maybe a few times a week in the, in the climbing gym. Yeah. Uh, last year, I took her outside and out of fun. She enjoyed it and, and then mountain biking. And I took her for little hikes. And yeah, so they will be, they are pretty lucky to be, you know, uh, in Canmore, with the beautiful mountain towns. And you have pretty much uh, activities just on the doorstep. So yeah, we're pretty lucky. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's so I was just going to teach them whatever I can. And up to them, if you want, if they want to go back to Nepal, uh, they can go back. Um, uh, if they want to stay here, or yeah, it's up to them. No, they want to be quiet, they might be better than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, your, your whole <laughs> country is, is a beautiful, beautiful country. And I've had amazing experiences there myself. And I will definitely take my daughters to Nepal at some point. But with our, 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 our talk here, I think one of the messages that I, I get sharing is that family is probably the most important thing to you. And I think yeah. that's just a beautiful message. And uh, I thank you for sharing that with everyone uh, who's listening and, and our Yamneska community and our family. And uh, I'll just, uh, I think we've got a question here. So Tim is going to hand me a question. And if anyone's wondering why you're looking at sharing with one background and me with another, we figured out that if we sat in the same room, which was what I was envisioning, and we'd be in chairs, we'd be talking back and forth, we wouldn't be two meters apart. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was my, you know, my <laughs> thinking this oh, you know, yeah. like that. <laughs> Yeah, I thought yeah. you were locked in rooms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm in one room at our office and Charing's in another room. And we have closed doors, yeah. you know, <laughs> different computers. But here is a, a question. What is the hardest part of climbing Everest for Sherpas and non-Sherpas? Well, right from the start of the base camp. Yeah. Like constructing yeah. the base even, camp. Even, for some people, you know, even some people getting to the base camp, it's because of the elevation, right? So yeah. Yeah. Everything them, it's hard. Yeah, yeah. You need to have a break every step. <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then every every step you go higher, you're higher. <laughs> so the altitude keeps being a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Say everything is hard, like yeah. yeah. Unless you're Fully acclimatized and your current, then yeah, it might be easier. But yeah, first timer, it's everything right from the start. It is hard. Yeah, yeah. So, is there anything you'd like to uh, share with uh, the Yamneska family and uh, um, people who are maybe watching our our chat here before we say goodbye to everybody? Yeah. So first of all, I'd like to thank Yamneska for giving me this golden opportunity to work for you guys. Um, without you guys, I won't be here in Canada. And uh, thank you for giving me a new life. Yeah, so thank you, Deb, Jesse, and Lane, and all the Yamniska family, all the staff, and all the, the super talented guys like you guys. Yeah, so stay safe, stay healthy, and see you guys all down the mountains again. Well, thank you for sharing, sharing, and uh, namaste. Namaste, thank you. <laughs> one more question here. Oh, we got one more question. What was your favorite climb you did so far? What is your favorite climb that you've done so far? I think um, Alaska. Yeah, like in Alaska. Yeah, and and like in Canada, I think Athabasca. All right, and in Alaska, was it uh, Denali? Yeah, I did Denali as well. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. The most like it's uh, because the the most interesting part is like landing on the you know on the glacier. Yeah. And then yeah. You start on the glaciers. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, in the Rockies. Yeah, like the area, the Columbia is built. 
beautiful valleys. Yeah, I mean, even the driving to there, that's one of the most like, yeah, scenic uh, drive in my life. Yeah. yeah, maybe there's a new <laughs> opportunity in Nepal to have ski planes land in the Western Coombe. <laughs> <laughs> No, I have seen some people, yeah, they, they ski, yeah, through the Western Coom, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. But landing the ski plane there. Uh, I don't know. There is not much. I think the space will be too small for the plane. I don't know. It, yeah, it's going to be probably tough. too high, I think. Too high. <laughs>